three photographers. One travelled north in the 1930s. One travelled south in the 1970s. One has stayed in the north all his life. Three sets of photographs. Three stories of the industrial north. What are the links between them? And why, after years in obscurity, have two sets of photographs recently had their first public showing? In the early part of this century, there existed in Northern England a race of people unknown to those in the South. Today, it's difficult to realize that prior to the documentary movement of the 1930s, there were very few images of these people. Anthropologist Tom Harrison, the man on the left, had discovered the North while working in Borneo. All the natives knew of England had been Bolton, which had supplied them with manufactured goods. Realising he knew nothing of the North, Tom Harrison returned to England and set up headquarters in Davenport Street, Bolton. Here he began to recruit a team of writers and artists for a unique social experiment, to record in painstaking detail the rituals and behaviour of these exotic and unknown peoples in our own country. The project became known as mass observation, and photography was an important part of their study. Humphrey Spender was their photographer. He now lives and works at his studio in Chelmsford, but in the slump of the 1930s, having trained as an architect, found himself unemployed. He had to turn to the newer professions of the emerging mass media. Through working as a freelance photographer for such papers as the Daily Mirror, he was thrown into a society deeply divided by education, language and class. Both he and his brother, the poet Stephen Spender, were part of the generation of young upper middle class intellectuals who saw the need to redress the balance between the leaders of society and the led. We did, we did act, we did um, w march and, and take and wave things and, and talk a lot and shout. Um, so, I mean my politics I, I suppose have to be described as, as left and socially minded, yes. So, socialist minded. George Orwell, J.B. Priestley and Bill Brandt had already made their own expeditions into the industrial north. In 1937, Humphrey Spender's journey began. He travelled to Bolton to begin work for mass observation. Humphrey Spender's task was to observe without being seen. His equipment was a small, lightweight camera, and dressed in an old gabardine, he set out to make contact with these unknown peoples. 
I saw mass observation as a chance of getting to know people. As you see, I think one of the difficulties, we were brought up in a very, very uh, protected, privileged kind of way, which I suppose was very typical of upper middle class then. We had nannies and governesses, and we were protected from what our parents would have considered bad influences, the urchin, the street urchin, the gutter snipe, th this kind of language was used. So that, obviously, there developed in, our, in the back of our mind two things, conflicting things. One, a kind of attractions about people of what we were brought up to believe were lo the lower class, and the other, a fear of them. So that uh, many situations of photography at Bolton, for instance, uh, were fraught with embarrassment because one I was forced into pubs and uh, what to me were, were quite sort of frightening uh, social confrontations. That tension between fear and attraction is reflected in some of his work. These photographs, empty of people, appear more like still life. Mass observation was radically different from previous attempts by social investigators to study the working class. Instead of looking down on a community, their ambition was to become part of that community, moving quietly through pubs, church outings, political meetings, making notes, making candid observations, and recording bits of overheard conversation. They set out to amass material that would reveal a new understanding of the North as they said, to make visible the invisible patterns of everyday life. And as informed social scientists, they were able to criticize a government and a metropolitan press indifferent to the hardships of industrial life. For Humphrey Spender, this formed the context in which he would work. He was like an anthropologist with a camera. Each day, the observers were given their tasks by Tom Harrison at Davenport Street. We used to come down to an absolutely revolting breakfast, and Tom used to be there, possibly shaving or reading the newspaper. Uh, he used to say, go off and do that. There's a fantastic football match today, or, or there's a lot going on in terms of a local by-election, perhaps. But then ordinary life, ordinary matters of living, the way people lit their cigarettes in pubs, um, in particular in a place like Worktown, Bolton, how people played dominoes, the movements of their hands, the way they opened their hand of dominoes. I remember once he got going in a quite hysterical kind of way about how people held their cups when they were drinking tea. and. Uh, I, on those kind of occasions, he would say things like, for all we know, the whole future of the world may depend on making observations and keeping records of precisely those small, specific actions of people. Many of the observers' reports were like verbal snapshots. Woman, 55, poor working class, blue serge dress. Big blue shawl, clogs, went into store for eggs. Nodded to woman. How many? Only two. She handed over two pence and the two cracked eggs were put into her bag. Shall I keep any more for you? I'll be back later. Middle class woman, 36 in grey dress. Hat, coat in brown shoes, low heels, sour face. Small dog in car. Left car, entered fish market. Bought fish after some minutes argument about the price and quality came back to car. I asked him, who were the MPs for Bolton? He said after a slight pause, Entwistle and Haslam, isn't it? He did not know the mayor of Bolton. So I put to him the question, what was the colour of Queen Mary's wedding dress? 
He'd never heard of her. And when I showed astonishment, he said, Well, won't she be headed? Humphrey Spender was joined in Bolton by writers and painters, here with artist Graham Bell on the roof of Bolton Art Gallery. In that unfamiliar, grimy landscape, these visitors saw a strange beauty. I never was quite clear why he wanted painters. He, he wanted subjective as well as objective reactions. And I think, uh, clearly, painters are going to make, going to provide a subjective reaction to the thing that they find. In building a record of this town, Tom Harrison saw the subjective work of artists like William Coldstream, here painting a panorama of Bolton, as complementing the objective analysis of the observer. But how was photography used? Tom Harrison thought um, of photography simply as a a useful method of recording human behavior. Um, I don't know whether he would have admitted that um, what Winston Orden always used to claim, that the camera is a bloody liar. I don't think Tom would probably have agreed with that. And he thought that he was recording truth. Truth, it seemed, simply existed and that it could be captured by the photographic image was of fundamental importance to the working of the documentary concept. It, it just seemed to me that the photograph was invalidated if the subject knew that it was being photographed, because something very false um, emerges. If they didn't know I was there, they were going to be truthfully seen to be doing what they were doing. Um, and that was my main objective, to, to state a truth. Sometimes that documentary truth could be transformed, composing random elements of everyday life into a dreamlike image. I think the, this is one of the occasions when I, I realized that I, I just thought, well, that makes a marvelous photograph. I don't know that I was conscious of any uh, surrealist qualities in it. I think it was simply became uh, something which at that particular moment, with the wind in that particular direction and the billowing of the, I think they were uh, pillow cases or, and trousers, uh, they seemed to me not only comic, but, but just something which had to be recorded. Uh, mass observation never had any money, and uh, so that even to pay for the processing and printing of these was quite a strain. And in the various publications that Mass Observation made, I think there's a collection of one, two, three, four, about uh, 12 books, uh, they were never able to afford to have any photographs reproduced. But a new magazine saw the visual potential of documentary. In 1938, the newly formed Picture Post asked Humphrey Spender to join their team of young photographers, Bert Hardy, Kurt Hutton and Bill Brandt. And though his Bolton photographs were forgotten, one of Humphrey Spender's first assignments was a photographic tour of Britain's major towns. This led him to Tyneside. The Tyneside had become notorious for the ghastly unemployment and terrible kind of slum conditions and total depression of the whole area. And Tom Hopkinson, um, who ran a, quite a propagandist editorial policy for Picture Post, um, rarely wanted to, to show this up, and he sent me up there. We produced a set of pictures and an article, which was a very s a s serious castigation of what was going on up there. And some of the photographs I took were in slum dwellings, where there was one gas mantle and 
five people sleeping in one bed and, that, and this kind of thing. The Tyneside article provoked a strong reaction. I have tried to tell Southerners what poverty really is, but each time I've mentioned the North, they say that poverty does not exist today. Members of this Chamber of Commerce are very annoyed with the pictures that appear in picture posts. Tyneside is not down and out. On the contrary, we're at present busy with rearmament and other contracts. The hopeless expression on the woman's face, the meagre supply of food, is eloquent to the misery and misfortune of Tyneside. I have seen, I have been. Let us hope a few copies of picture posts find their way to Westminster. This article uh, disclosed the bad conditions to such in such a powerful way that the mayor and council of Tyneside wrote to Tom Hopkinson and said it was a very unfair presentation, a very biased presentation, and could he please correct the impression made by doing the story again under their directive. And so I went up there again and was put at the disposal of the mayor and the council and we produced an article which was to do with new housing estates and to do with mayoral banquets and uh, it, in, in general they didn't realize it but they were slightly making fools of themselves by dictating so clearly what we should do. Tom published this absolutely as they wanted and I think he didn't need to make the point that they had really underlined the poverty rather than contradicted it. Close enough, um, in the same issue, is a sequence of photographs by Bill Brown. In the pages of Picture Post, from the end of the 1930s and through the war, the scandals of inequality were exposed and a better Britain was hoped for. In this vision, they said, we have not imagined away South Wales or Tyneside or our confused system of education. We've tried to show how they can be reconstructed. This new Britain could, we believe, be realized, given goodwill within 10 years, not in the time of our great-grandchildren, but before we or our wives have been worn out, before many of our children have grown up. What chance, they asked, is there of such a Britain as we describe being brought into existence? Derek Smith born in 1954 into a working-class family in that new Britain of welfare and wartime hopes. He inherited their dreams and could now aspire to a world beyond the horizons of his own community. Photography was an important influence. Bill Brown exhibition came to Middlesbrough, I think in 1969, and it was one of the first exhibitions of photography I think I ever saw. And I remember coming out feeling really inspired, thinking, well, this is what I want to do. You know, I want to be a photographer. And I was only 15 at that time. I was obviously influenced by the style of the pictures, and Bill Brandt's pictures do have a, a very strong style. They're very heavily black and white, very, very mysterious, partly through his, his, his connections with surrealism in the late 20s. Um, and a lot of them looked as if they'd been taken by some kind of visitor. He now lives and works in North Shields, Tyneside. But he left the North for the first time in 1973 when he was 19 and had won a place at the Polytechnic of Central London. Going to London to study photography, not just the, the education itself, the academic thing, but um, the idea of being in a metropolis and uh, not really having lived there before, and having these two completely different areas, 
um, to compare and contrast. At the, at the other end of a, t of a train journey um, was very, very important. <laughs> This set of montage photographs I did in the first year at college called The Lad's Day Out, I think um, puts my initial reactions to London into a, a nutshell, the, the kind of um, bewilderment that the space is and the, the grandeur. And um, what I did was place this set of men. It was from a photograph I'd found in a junk shop in Middlesbrough by foundry workers in uh, typical picture postcard scenes from London. And uh, in very many ways, uh, this, this was me, really, in, in London. Derek Smith didn't take to London and returned continuously to the northeast over the next three years. But on his first journey home, he found his relationship to the community he had left had unexpectedly changed. After having spent three months in London, four months in London, um, I went back for the first time and the area was as if I'd first, I'd only just visited it. There were things that just hit me straight away that uh, I, I decided I just had to record and photograph. And without really ta being taken outside of that situation, I don't think it would have ever occurred to me to take pictures on that kind of, with that kind of commitment and on that kind of scale. I was trying to make a visual history of the North East and realised that, that this history had to be undertaken. The photographs show the community still very much alive, but undergoing changes. And the photographs have documented that change and decline. And of course the photographs have ended with that decline, the demolition of the streets, the clearing of the land. This photograph here I could have taken candidly. Uh, I'm sure I wouldn't have got a picture quite as strong. They're, from, from this photograph, there's no evidence that uh, they're, they're, they're aware of, of my presence. Um, but in fact, the, setting up this picture um, did involve you know, quite a long conversation. I've not met these ladies before, but you know, in the process of the conversation, I found out that um, my grandfather worked opposite this row of houses in a foundry, and that um, they, they knew my grandfather and um, used to drink in the same pub as him, which, is very, which, which obviously established a better rapport. Um, I don't think I could have taken that candidly. It would have been uh, a bit too sneaky, I think. Like, like a lot of the photographs here, this one is typical um, summer, midsummer afternoon, waiting for um, the newspapers to arrive, the, uh, the local newspaper to arrive. And um, that, again, was taken after <coughs> a long, long conversation. Sitting here with this group um, wasn't a difficult thing for me to do, even though I was a lot younger than they were. I mean, I, at that time I was only, what, 21, 22. And I found I could uh, be part of that group very, very easily. And my, the presence of my camera was no problem at all, no problem whatever. They were very interested in being photographed. And in the process of, of photographing, I would uh, get to know a lot more about that particular area, that particular street, the people in the group. And so it was a two-way thing, really. It was more of a rapport than just going in and snatching pictures, which a lot of photographers do. These intimate records of his own community brought him professional recognition as a photographer. They were exhibited, prints were published, 
and the Royal Photographic Society selected him as Young Photographer of the Year. But at this point, he was beginning to question the photographic career open to him. A lot of my doubts about uh, the practice of photography for myself uh, had to do with um, the fact that the areas I was photographing had changed and were disappearing and um, that there was very little else uh, left there to photograph. I didn't really, I didn't particularly want to photograph what had replaced the communities, uh, particularly on the east side. And so I was at an impasse. And also the fact that the, after the exhibitions, there didn't seem to be any kind of uh, context for the photographs at all, apart from occasional use to illustrate an article. Unwilling to follow a career in photojournalism, unsure of what he could do in his home community, he went to Sussex University as artist in residence. I spent a while taking my own pictures around Brighton and uh, Sussex, but uh, producing nothing of any real consequence. Um, but the, um, I had a small exhibition and in the first term I was there, and um, one of the art history lecturers said um, how similar my pictures were to uh, a collection that they had at the university, and it was called the Mass Observation Archive. I'd heard a little bit about it, and he said I ought to go and look at them. There were hundreds and hundreds of these pictures in, in negatives. A lot of them obviously had never been printed up before. So I um, printed up the pictures, organised an exhibition, the exhibition toured and was quite successful. You know, it seemed that these pictures had not been uh, looked at for many years, probably 40 years since they were first taken. observation archive, Derek Smith had by chance discovered the negatives of the Bolton photographs taken by Humphrey Spender 40 years earlier. Before they had seemed exotic because the people and places were unknown. Now the people and places had vanished and once again they appeared strange. Critics and art dealers began to revalue Humphrey Spender's pictures and these anthropological documents were now being assessed in terms of their market value. An offer was made by a gallery for the vintage prints that I actually printed in 1937-38. Um, and these prints were not very, very good prints. They had decayed in, in time. They'd gone very brown and perhaps faded quite a lot. And I offered to do much better prints because the negatives still exist. Uh, but they weren't interested in getting good prints. They weren't interested in getting the best out of the negatives. They were interested in the fact that what they were buying were vintage prints and had a value as such. Well, the vintage prints will have been bought. Uh, um, I won't go into the what I think of the price that was paid, but certainly they will be sold at a considerable profit. And of course, the longer they are kept, uh, the, the higher the profit. I think um, dis discovering the Spender photographs and uh, the success of the exhibition was uh, important to me because I realised that um, there were other areas that needed to be researched and that exhibitions were a viable context for photographs. It was very much a public context. It was the first time, apart from having my own exhibition, that um, I became aware of um, the public's involvement with uh, exhibitions. Derek Smith left Sussex University and returned north. He took no more photographs. 
Instead, he became fascinated by reclaiming images which had been lost, discarded or neglected, and began to research and organize exhibitions for the side gallery in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. The side gallery is quite special because it reflects, unlike a lot of other galleries, it reflects the life and culture of the area that it's in. And one of my main areas at the moment is of research is that of organizing exhibitions about communities on Tyneside and building up an archive of photographs and channeling them into exhibitions and publications as well. Very cheap and accessible publications that will support the exhibition. That's the publication. Uh, which, uh, I've seen in the he started to investigate the area around him and track down local photographers. I'd heard about Jimmy Forsyth from a lot of people. He was a mythical figure who would walk around the streets in the 50s with a box camera with very little resources. He'd been unemployed since 1945. Uh, he had systematically documented shops, streets, work, places of work. Oh, what would motivate, what motivated you to go out and take these pictures? Well, uh, I think what really started me off was uh, I know it's bad to get pictures of uh, how where working class people live, you know, and like that. But because uh, most of the time it used to be like, you know, royal palaces or royal castles or all this sort of thing. Not where the working class live. And uh, in the history books, you never see anything like that. Did you expect it to change as much as it did? No, really, I thought Scotch Woodward would still look like it did. No, even now, you know, I, I just took it in case, more or less. Do you think all these changes have been for the better? Well, not all of them. The worst part is when they shifted all the community and scattered it all over the place, you know, because uh, people don't know anybody anymore. Like, I mean, it takes, you know, a generation or so for people to get accused, accustomed to one another again in the same way. People don't share like they used to, you know, when they had them back streets. I don't know whether it's because they had the, all them back streets or whether it's just because the community's got moved all over the place, you know, and you have to pick up again a fresh light. That's the only bad thing about it. The one did knock it down, like. Who's this man here? This is something you've never seen. Yeah. Street traders like that, yeah. sharpening cutlery. I'm not sure if he's, whether he's Mr. Francis or not, but it's got Mr. Francis on the machine. Oh, yes, you picked that up. Yeah. Oh. Would you talk uh, to him? Actually, I never. Actually, I've never talked to him at all. You just I, I just. I just walked past you and I said, "Oh, I'd like to have one of them. A photo of one of them uh, old grinding machines, you know, for sharpening scissors and that." And I just snapped him. He, he never even knew I took it. Maybe that was better. Like you know, he got him natural. I That's was, not a natural one, though. Hmm. But it's still a good picture. Well, I knew them because they lived at the back of me. Like. Did they ask you to take that picture? No, I just said, uh, I liked it. I was taking pictures in some of the shops then, see, so I asked them if they didn't mind. Uh, so I took, t I took two in that shop and one in the Haley and a bit farther along, like, on there you can read, pies, four pence, six pence, eight pence and ten pence. Wow, you, pay you pay more than that to look at the pie now. It's um, the opening of the Willows, yeah, isn't it? That's the, that's the opening of the first high flats, the Willows, on who, Scotch Road. Who are these people here? By Mr. Gateskill and Mr. Dan Smith. That's, uh, that's Dan Smith unveiling the, the monument, what they call the monstrosity. The monstrosity? Uh, from what I can gather, it's not there, no, I've never... It, it disappeared, it's you know. It's been vandalised, perhaps. Yeah, I think it was made of bronze, you know, a lot of it. And somebody just whipped it for scrap. <laughs> but it, it vanished, uh, and nobody knew where it vanished. This is, uh... Oh, that's... That's, that's Gates School, isn't it? Yeah, that's Mr. Gates School making a speech. And then uh, that little lad there, see, he had him gotten to plant trees afterwards, because he said, if you let the children plant the trees, they will respect the trees and look after them, you know. But, but where I live, they chop them all down. I felt Jimmy Forsyth's pictures needed to be seen, not just on Tyneside, but on a, a national scale. Because these changes in uh, industrial communities in the 60s and 70s didn't just happen here. 
and it's one of the first examples I'd come across of somebody from within a working class community with very little education or technical skills to speak of producing uh, a systematic and what turned out to be a very authoritative document of his own community. They're very naive in many ways, they have very primitive qualities, but uh, they, are, they do have qualities, and they're qualities which a lot of accomplished photographers strive for. The Scotswood area has been demolished and all that remains are the photographs. But how many people from the old community will actually come to the gallery to see the exhibition? There are quite a lot of limitations attached to a gallery context. By no, by no means perfect. Um, a lot of people obviously come to look at the pictures there. But um, the situation um, is more akin to perhaps a church. And the atmosphere is very quiet. People very rarely speak. They, they whisper to each other when they come into a gallery. Will the same process take place of turning his work into collectible art prints as has happened with Humphrey Spender's work? Works of art have traditionally been shown in galleries and people still think of uh, photographic galleries in that way. But unless the pictures were shown um, in that context, um, they wouldn't be shown at all. They would never be published, for example. But um, the fact that the Sunday Times have taken these pictures up and the fact that uh, the media are very interested in them um, and other things that have happened suggest that these pictures uh, might, at one time or another, become collected as um, art objects, so especially where there's a, uh, a vintage um, element attached. For example, Jim Fasai's vintage prints might be uh, collected in the future. If we, if we didn't put the photographs on display in the gallery, um, they would never be seen by anybody. Jimmy Forsyth is still taking pictures. Spurred on by the success of the exhibition, he bought a new camera and is trying his hand at colour photographs. Since the war, Humphrey Spender has given up photography and concentrated on painting and teaching art. There's always something convincing about a photograph, whereas um, with a drawing, you can, uh, you can do something so dreadful that you want to tear it up. Uh, that, I think, one can't do so easily in photography. So. I've always wished, on the whole, to be a, a good painter rather than a good photographer. I found a set of photographs on the Mauritania in a cupboard in Swanland's shipyard. And this suggested to me an alternative to uh, the gallery. And in fact, the exhibition that I'm producing will open up in the works canteen at the yard. And the Mauritania, I felt, was quite important because it showed how a government subsidy had provided work for something like 8,000 Tynesiders for three, four years and to produce the world's largest and fastest liner. In fact, it became a wonder of the world for a time. The, the success of the Mauritania depended on skills and traditions of craftsmanship and also technological developments that uh, had happened on Tyneside at the turn of the century and which still survive today, but which are gradually being eroded. Because there are many parallels between the 30s and today, the, the, the social scene is very, very similar. High unemployment um, and, and many changes. 
And the use to which photography was put in the, thir in the late 30s and during the war and after the war in a, a magazine like Picture Post with text in a very committed um, medium, a very committed context, um, which is involved in some kind of social reform. There ought to be some place for this to happen today. Most of the photographs that are taken now are commissioned, commissioned by the press. And unless this happens, it seems that very few photographs are made. And unfortunately, the press seems to be a very conservative um, context. Galleries could provide some kind of alternative context, but there's this tradition of uh, putting a single photograph in a frame on a wall uh, on its own. There's a great myth about a photograph being worth a thousand words, which I think is well and truly a myth. You know, which thousand words do you give a photograph? And a photograph has got to be presented in sets. It's got to be given text to anchor the meaning, to make a point, to make a statement. Is this a photograph of a painter or a laborer? It's actually an unemployed man who, at the age of 52, has found himself redundant for the second time and will probably never get another job again. It also happens to be a picture I took of my father.